So WIPs are weakly interacting massive particles. It's essentially a gas of particles that have, have almost no interactions with the, the visible world. They're heavy particles, they're electrically neutral, um, I said weakly interacting, and they're slow moving and they don't decay. These are the basic principles of the basic one. These worked great here, yeah, there we go. All right, so this is again a computer simulation of what the universe looks like in dark matter. All the color is dark matter. This is moving forward in time now. And you can see gradually the dark matter is becoming more and more clustered and more and more concentrated. Each of the little specks you see here is a cluster of galaxies, or the small specks might be galaxies themselves. I notice how it's congealing into the center. Well, we're focusing on an interesting place. The center is, is picked by hand by the person doing the simulation. And now we're zooming in. And this is something resembling roughly like our local group. So that, for example, or maybe that could have been the Milky Way galaxies. I show here as a chart what's known as the standard model of particle physics. These are all of the particles we know to exist in our universe. Okay? So that standard model includes six types of particles known as quarks, and six types of, types of particles known as leptons. <coughs> And then these four bosons, which are the particles that create force. Okay, so some of these you're familiar with. There's the photon, okay, that's light. There's the up and down quarks. These make up protons and neutrons. Okay, so three quarks, does everyone know that three quarks make up protons and neutrons? Have you heard that before? Um, there's the electron, okay. Um, there's also these three neutrinos. And it was thought for a while that maybe the neutrinos can make up the dark matter. There are two reasons we think they aren't now. One is that they move too quickly to agree very well with the overall structure of our universe. Galaxies and things wouldn't have formed in, in sufficient numbers and in sufficient densities if, they, if the neutrinos were dark matter. The other thing is that we now know that there isn't enough mass in neutrinos in the universe to account for the dark matter. So again, they might be a small fraction of the dark matter, kind of like machos and other and black holes and such, but they're not most of the dark matter. Okay. So we have to invent some new kind of particle to make up dark matter. And particle physicists do this all the time. There are particle physicists who their entire job is to imagine new kinds of particle physics theories and new kinds of particles and, and try to figure out what problems they might solve and how you might go about detecting them. Well, one of the very best ideas we have for such a theory is known as supersymmetry. So this is a theory that's been around more than 30 years, but we still have never seen a supersymmetric particle. We're, we're looking for them actively here and elsewhere. But so far, they've evaded our detection. The idea of supersymmetry is that matter and force are, in, are not independent of one another. In other words, you can't have matter without force. You can't have force without matter. So if we look back at this last figure, we have all of these, what are known as fermion particles, quarks and leptons. In all of these, we think of as matter. Okay? Electrons, protons, neutrons, these are all matter. right? But then we have these other four particles, which are known as bosons, or force carrying particles. The, pho the photon, for example, is the, the particle that makes electromagnetism work. If there were no photons in the universe, I could take my hand and I could push it right through this table effortlessly. And the reason I could do that is because there wouldn't be any repulsion between the atoms in my hand and the atoms in that table, because there would be no electromagnetic force. Because of the photon, it repels and stops. So the forces happen because of these particles. OK. So the idea behind supersymmetry is that matter and force, or fermion particles and boson particles, have to exist in pairs. For every fermion, there's a boson. And for every boson, there's a fermion. So that means that for the photon, which is a boson, there must also exist a fermion that's a lot like it, but matter instead of force. So we call that a photino. Similarly, the electron has to have a selectron, which is, brings into a, a existence a force of its own, and et cetera. All of the various particles have to have a super partner or supersymmetric particle. So how do you look for supersymmetric particles? One way is you go deep underground and look for, for what's being detected. Oh, sorry, you have a question. So from, uh, Higgs particle, could that be the Higgs particle decay very, very quickly. So even if there was, were a lot of Higgses out there that were making up the dark matter, in a fraction of a second later, there wouldn't be any left. So unfortunately, no. 
So one way you can look for these, these weakly interacting massive particles that come from supersymmetry is to go deep underground and try to actually see them in your detector. So this is the Sudan mine in northern Minnesota. And so I don't know, how, how deep is that, Eric? 2,400. 2,400 feet below the surface of the Earth, they have a detector made of germanium and silicon that's looking for a wimp coming in, scattering off the nuclei at their target, and recoiling away. Okay? It's a very hard business to do, but these experiments are really interesting in getting closer and closer to um, hopefully discovering or ruling out these kinds of particles. So another way you can study supersymmetric dark matter particles is using a particle accelerator. And here you actually create new kinds of matter. All right, so it, you know we're, we're at this site. This is the building we're at right now. Um, so at the Tevatron, we have this three-mile ring that we accelerate protons and antiprotons around and we smash them together. When you smash together particles with enough energy, you, you basically exploit Einstein's equals mc squared equation. Okay? So Einstein said with that equation that energy and mass can be converted into one another. Or another way of looking at it is mass is just one particular kind of energy. So if you want to make a, a new kind of particle, one with more mass than, than other particles might have, what you do is you take two lighter particles, smash them together, and in the process, you get heavy particles coming out. And experiments like the Tevatron here at Fermilab, or this experiment called the Large Hadron Collider in, in uh, Switzerland, which is now under construction, these are really the premier facilities to look for these kinds of new forms of matter. Let me give you an idea of just how spectacularly massive this experiment is at, in, in the building in, in Europe. The Large Hadron Collider is a 17-mile tunnel. It basically goes under the city of Geneva and then into France, because it's on the border. Um, the protons will be traveling around this at 99.999999% of the speed of light. Okay, it's a ridiculous amount of energy. Um, when they collide together, the, the collision will contain 14 trillion electron volts of energy in every proton-proton collision. So, and it's a lot of protons, too. So every second, 30 million bunches of protons come into the collision. And every one of those bunches, there's 100, million, 100 billion protons. So not all of those protons wind up actually colliding, but about 600 million collisions per second occur. So it's, it's just, the engineering that goes into this is absolutely mind-boggling. If supersymmetry exists, I think it's fair to say that the Large Hadron Collider will almost certainly discover. You'll see not just one kind of supersymmetric particle, but several, and you'll be able to measure a lot of this properly. So in the next few years, supersymmetry.